It began as an idea to transform the landscape of motorsport. To entertain. To innovate. To educate on a global scale. To start something special. Be part of something special. To revolutionize car technology. To help save the planet. If you want to associate with a new sport that is trying to change the world for better, I think we should have a talk. Passion is one of the greatest motivators that exist. You have a good idea, when you have serious people, then things happen. In 2050, we might be the only motorsport that exists. It's electric, it's younger skewing, it's all about the technology, it's about engagement. If you're putting a name on a kit or on a venue, you know, that's great. But here we are with our partners changing the world. The sea is already swallowing villages and eroding shorelines. Glaciers are melting at a pace unprecedented in modern times. My dream is that every car in the world is electric one day. We see Formula E as the promoter of the circus. Competition is the key for technology progress. This is not a technology demonstration. This is a race with drivers fighting to win. I have a choice to make, hit you or die. It's your choice. It's a rare piece of real estate in the world of sport. Yeah, electric cars are the future. The brands are now honestly worried about sustainability. It's an exciting new model. Pure electric racing in the cities. It's a new journey. It's a new path. I think for Formula E, there is no limits. You hear the tires screeching. You hear the brakes. What a show. I've never seen so many constructors all together at the same time. It's potentially a game changer in terms of motorsport. It's actually the purest motorsport series out there. I mean, I had to make a huge bet on what I thought was the next big thing. I took a leap of faith. The start of the new Formula E season is 12 weeks away. It will take in 11 countries, including four new host cities. The job to secure these locations lies with the boss. So I travel about 50% of the time. Last week, for example, out of seven days, I was two full ones, so 48 hours in the air. Hong Kong, Shanghai, Hangzhou, Dubai, Nice, New York, Sao Paulo and back to London. So here we are in London traffic. And uh, traffic means pollution. To make, you know, traffic not mean pollution is why we need electric cars. My path to sport was a bit uh, of a detour. From university, I went to work on a political position in Brussels. I um, went back to Spain to the government as um, assistant to the prime minister. And uh, then I got married. And when I got married, I decided to stop uh, politics and to um, look for other things to do. Morning. Because I've seen the last email that he sent to Cuesta. Or how to know if Allianz or Bovet. I told him, I think the car is dead. I had some friends who were uh, involved in motorsport. So I got involved in the Formula One, uh, on the business side of the Formula One, I would say. We did uh, a GP2 team. So we, ha we had actually our hand in every 
every aspect of the of the business. TV, sponsorship, racing. Show, show me some kind of like. Uh, okay, well, we're working on some uniforms, actually. Hugo Boss wanted the logo there. No, we're, that, we're just yeah. trying it out at the moment, so it's a work in progress. I think in the contract says... Left. Left. No? Yeah. So it has to be on the left. I think what Alejandro um, does so well is that he's a leader and he's a visionary. It's, it's the same passion and leadership that we've had since season zero or birth of this idea till now. It's just more people. And with more people, we're more powerful to promote Formula E, our partners, and electric mobility. I had already thought of this idea before. I was uh, brokering a deal with a, with a potential sponsor for Formula One, and the deal didn't happen in the last minute because the sponsor had concerns about the sustainability credentials of the sport. So I thought, we have a problem. Then in 2011 um, is when we had this, uh, well, the big idea, let's say, to create a new championship, a green championship, uh, innovation championship. That big idea happened by chance over dinner with two friends. One was FIA President Jean Todd, the other Antonio Tajani, European Commissioner for Industry and Entrepreneurship. I definitely didn't think it was going to be a dinner in which we would discuss uh, the creation of a new championship. Not at all, actually. And you know, the, the restaurant Estresa in Paris is a very small restaurant run by these six Italian brothers. It's great pasta, great food. You know, I was just looking forward to a nice dinner with a couple of friends. Antonio Tajani at that meeting was really clear that, you know, the future for the industry was lower pollution standards, new technologies, because really the, the pollution was becoming a huge problem in cities and, and of course climate change and global warming. And that's when Jean actually, I remember saying, FIA wants to create a, an electrical championship. And I said, well, you know, I would love to be the promoter of that. During that dinner, the three men discussed how this could work. On the back of a serviette, Formula E was born. Obviously, all of us hear millions of ideas all the time, and we let them pass, but I definitely didn't want to let this one pass. We uh, are both coming from motorsports, so we, uh, we wanted to do something uh, different. They came up with this idea. When he came back, I, I thought that was exactly what we were here for. And uh, he didn't need to convince me at all. I'm his partner, I'm his best friend. Whatever he, he, he goes for, you know, I'll, I'll follow. Not everyone was so easily sold. I was one of the majority of the people that were thinking that this project was not going to succeed. My first reaction was, someone's answering a question that no one's been asking. My initial feeling was that I didn't know whether that could be possible. It was going to be slow. First reaction, I was a little bit skeptical, actually. I thought, uh, how's it going to work? We've seen championships start, do one season, and stop. Admittedly, we were a little skeptical at first to see if they'd be able to pull off building the cars and making the cars reliable. There was probably the preconceived idea that Formula E was maybe a little bit ahead of its time. We had no cars, we had no cities, we had no teams, we had no drivers, we had absolutely nothing, you know. Uh, the key challenges was everything. Step up. Lucas de Grassi. Lucas is a, a very old friend of mine. He drove in my team in GP2, and uh, he's a great driver, but he's also a great businessman. He's really clever. He's a, an engineer. He's everything in one, Lucas. When Alejandro called me in London, I, I went to, to meet him. I said, OK, that's a great idea, but uh, who, who is the company? This was going to be a very capital-intensive project, in order to raise capital, we needed to have a long enough license to give hope to the investors that they would recover the capital at the end of the journey. So first we negotiated with the FIA, we got a 25 year long license exclusive to promote an electric formula race car around the world. Sales is never easy, right? Um, no CMO, CEO wakes up in the morning, unfortunately, and says, I want to partner with Formula E. But again, we have probably a story better than anyone else could possibly dream of having, and that we are more than motorsport. We are technology, we are innovation, we are sustainability, we race in city centers, i.e. we are global. 
So I think by having that combination, it's easier, but it's definitely not easy. It was clear a major backer was needed. Julius Baer is the leading independent wealth management company in the world. For us, uh, characteristics of this project is very much how we do business in, in Julius Baer. We're willing to invest in things we believe. We're willing to take some entrepreneurial calculated uh, risk. The most important sponsor that we ever had in Formula E was uh, Julius Baer. Back in 2011, I was introduced to Boris. He was already the CEO of Julius Bar. He was very young. We start talking about racing. He's very passionate about racing itself. And Lucas said, listen, there is this bank. We don't have a bank yet in Formula E, and uh, these guys are, are, are great. He then brought Alejandro around by saying, look, there could be a meeting of minds between the three of us. And uh, indeed, he was right. And Boris, with his vision, saw as an incredible platform to promote uh, new technologies, uh, a better future, the same vision as uh, Julius Bar has in terms of pushing society forwards. That's uh, what we're in business to do, is uh, to try to identify trends, uh, ideas, uh, people, and uh, put our money uh, behind it. And that really is a true sign of a, of a partnership that is beyond logos on a car. With Julius Baer on board, other sponsors soon followed. Actually, it's a very important day for Formula E. We finally you know, see the car. We've been working on it for a year. Great partners have made it possible. So yes, very important, very happy day. We tried to, to make Formula E happen in, in many different ways. We decided it was street tracks. We went to I don't know how many cities, we spoke to so many mayors, and then the calendar was starting to build up. We are presenting today DHL as the title sponsor of our race in Berlin. We start signing sponsors, we start signing uh, with cities, uh, the teams, all great believers or, or kind of crazy people, because at that time, believe me, that, that was, a, that was a, big, uh, a big belief. I think when you create a platform, it's good to share it with other companies that comes from other industries, from other walks of life, if you will. Um, there are synergies, there are exchanges, there is a platform for us to create something new together. We listened to the passion of Alejandro talking about changing the picture of motorsport with an electric motor racing series focused at inner city racing, addressing and bringing young fans interacting with the motor racing series via their smartphones. And we said, you know, this is an absolutely fantastic vision. And we said we want in from the very beginning. DHL was the first global logistics company to set itself a measurable carbon improvement target. We listened to Alejandro and his vision for the championship. And we felt Formula E really fit very nicely to our own sustainability commitment. Every single day, um, those I would say first six or seven brands, Qualcomm, DHL, Julius Baer, Michelin, they are very proud that they were here first. I helped to bring two teams into, into Formula E. Lucas de Grassi was doing the initial development on the first ever Formula E car, and he was very passionate about it straight away. That was very clear. From Lucas's perspective, it was you know, it was, this is going to be one part of the future of motorsport. And that was something that I think has been quite infectious in a way. Another team that I, I managed to, to, to bring into Formula 8 when we were building the business was the Virgin Race. He convinced me over a drink <laughs> uh, that the environmental story was an excellent one, uh, that it was the future of automotive. And having had a closer look at it, uh, he was absolutely correct. And then we needed good drivers, so then I helped to create a list. In the beginning, I just wanted to race. It seemed like an interesting series that was coming aboard. Three, four main manufacturers, then a few private teams. So I said, well, let's give it a try, you know, why not? I didn't know whether I was getting myself into one of these series uh, where you have a job for a little bit, everything's okay, and then you, then you realize that there's not going to be a job anymore in the next year because there's no more money. 
it felt right from the beginning to do it, even if I didn't really know what it was about. And now looking back at it, it was the best move I've made in my career. On to pre-season testing. Dunnington, day one. I remember sitting in the car, going out of the garage, and you have absolutely no idea what's what's going on. And that was really challenging, but as, at the same time, I like it. Exciting as a race driver to be, to have an input that is so important. When you see it coming from the beginning and you were there while everybody was laughing at Formula E, the teams, the community of motorsport, the other series, uh, I've been told many, many times, uh, go race with your Scalectrix. To see that progression, to see that happening in, in the grid in Beijing, um, I was yeah, extremely proud. Despite the doubters, with enough sponsors, teams and drivers signed up, the first ever Formula E race was ready. A new chapter in the history of motorsport was about to be written. I moved basically to Beijing for a month before the race. It was the craziest experience ever because nothing was ready, no one had done it before. We had no idea what we were doing. We were running around solving all the problems. And nobody really knew what to expect because all the cars were the same and, and everybody was completely unprepared. You wish you'd just go back there with the knowledge that you have now. It's a bit nicer than I expected, to be honest. It's, it's longer, it's more flat, it's quite wide. Obviously, race one in a new, in a new championship is something so special. It feels like it was yesterday. You know, so much has been said about this new single-seater Formula E uh, championship, but now it's time for action. We line up on the grid. At that point, you really just didn't know. Nobody had a clue and everybody was crossing fingers for everything to run smoothly. I will maintain that the, the, the most astonishing thing I've ever seen in Formula E was that first race in Beijing. The cars are all lined up. The lights are coming on, and for the first time, we go green in Beijing. And it was a proper motor race. And suddenly it was like, wow, this, this is it, this is, this is here. You've been working for, you know, two years flat out to get to that moment. Everything is going fine. The place was full, the guests were happy. And suddenly the last corner, I thought Nick was going to overtake Nico. Heidfeld's closing in as they come towards the final corner at turn 20. When I saw that we were having only three uh, corners left, I moved from the TV compound to the podium. I mean, on my way, I was literally running, and, and I heard the crowd, whoa. Uh, Nico hit me. I, I lost uh, steering. Uh, the suspension was, was damaged was going towards um, uh, the curb and then obviously you know with the size of the curb that you will lift off. I think I was in P5 or P6 at the time and I could see a ton of dust and sort of stuff being thrown up in the air. I had no idea it was a racing car. It felt like forever from the moment of liftoff to hitting the, the barrier. Then I was still with my eyes closed and was sort of waiting. I thought, hmm, when will I land? You know, then I was just hoping, actually. I was just a passenger. It is uh, not unfeasible that this could have stopped the whole show. I thought, this is unbelievable. I hope, first of all, that Heidfeld is safe. When I saw the, the image and the driver it wasn't coming out for for whatever reason. I, I thought that my whole dream was was over. The Nick Heidfield accident was a make or break moment for the championship. If something would have gone wrong, probably Formula A would have ended there in that minute. When I opened my eyes and I was upside down, I waited a few moments because I thought the marshals maybe would turn the car around and when that didn't happen, I 
I pulled out, out of the car. So there is Nick Heidfeld clambering out of his Venturi car. It's good to see. Suddenly we saw this hand coming out of the, of the cockpit and they go like this and I said, okay, we're good. And I think we might have a bit of a conversation here between these two. When I saw the guy coming out, I said, well, that's the best thing that could ever happen to us. Even if you kind of write it down to see what will be the perfect ending to, to, to one race, you, you couldn't even imagine on such a perfect ending, you know, and, and, and they did it. Obviously, it was uh, watched by so many people that probably wouldn't have watched Formula E or motorsport in general, and uh, the crash was so big that it was put on the map. The crash showed that it was not a show, it was a sport. People really fighting hard to get that position. Lucas Igrassi just was handed the first ever victory in a, in a Formula E race, which, which is kind of a destiny thing, but you know, there you go. Just by that race taking place, that was a huge statement. And that's what attracted the attention also of other big investors around the world. We were looking for a big investor, a strategic investor, because of course we were running out of cash again. Three or four times we were this close from falling down to the ground. I remember my first Formula E race and the overriding emotion I remember just one of excitement. I think it was the Malaysian race and the product was still in its formation. To go and see it, feel it, touch it, get some real exposure to it. They really wanted to uh, bring a digital, innovative, technology-driven mindset. Liberty Club are very active in all forms of content and entertainment, particularly sport. We have sports networks all over Europe, and then that transpired to be an opportunity for us to invest and actually become part owners of the business as well as be active partners. Formula E had liftoff. Three seasons, three champions, racing across five continents. And we're green in Paris. We go green in Berlin. We go racing in Buenos Aires. Nelson Piquet Jr. Oh my God, I cannot believe it. Oh, he hit him. Hit him. Sebastian Buemi, Lucas Degrassi. We are the champions! The problem with Formula E, a new championship like this with a new technology, is that you turn into a technology demonstration. And this is not a technology demonstration. This is a race, a real race, with drivers fighting to win. And you need good drivers for that, professional drivers. I cannot think of a better grid on the planet. If you speak to many people, they say that the level is as high as Formula One in terms of driver-wise. I think uh, it's too competitive now. <laughs> it's too much competition, it's getting too hard. The fact that it's an electric vehicle, fabulous. And that, I think, is what's caught the imagination of the manufacturers. But it's got to have good racing too, it's got to maintain that, and I think it will. So, to a new dawn. And with growing success comes growing demand. Three seasons in, after last year, we had almost 225 million media viewership. If you strip out the North American only series, that makes us the third most watched media motorsport in the world, which is just phenomenal. The whole kind of business is kind of a virtual circle now because, you know, one manufacturer comes and then companies follow. You know? So, um, like, Jaguar came and then Panasonic came behind them. But then you get the Germans coming and then you get all the component companies that provide components to those brands also want to be involved in the championship, they want to come to the races, they want to buy hospitality, and then again you get the, the same positive process again. This championship has grown more than anyone could have anticipated. But I think that's what keeps me awake at night right now is essentially the commercial side because I look at my responsibility of providing resources to the team and it's been getting to be a bit more challenging because you understand the quality of investments have gone up. But at the same time, I think the return of what we're getting on our investments has also been higher than what we had anticipated when we wrote out the business plan for the championship. We've all got to be aware that we ensure that we still all have a return. Otherwise, it's not a good 
financial investment. If it's not good financial investment, ultimately, it's got a, quite a short lifespan. In motor racing, it, it's too much of a business to be a pure sport, and it's too much of a sport to be a pure business. The two sit hand in hand. Cutting edge technology isn't cheap. So, you know, we've got very strong partners and also suppliers like Michelin, for example, who are supplying the tires to the championship. We've been very fortunate to have early adopters like DHL, Visa, Michelin, and Julius Baer, and new partners like Allianz, who have been able to use the, the platform of Formula E to deliver on their core goals and objectives. Sponsorship is never easy. In my latter years in Formula One, you probably see an uptake by businesses of about 2%. Whereas I find in Formula E, in 100 companies, I'd probably get 20 of them that would want to move forward to look at the process and look at the opportunities in Formula E. The brands are now looking opportunities to do something good for society. And clearly supporting a sport that promotes electric cars, that's something good for society. It's the most relevant form of motorsport that is out there currently. Everybody on the planet will be driving an electric vehicle in the foreseeable future. So the world is going that way anyway. There's no better way of sending a message than making it fun. It definitely shows the legitimacy of Formula E when you can get the big four German manufacturers, when Jaguar comes back into motor racing for the first time in 14 years and chooses Formula E. A few weeks ago, we confirmed by 2020 every Jaguar and Land Rover product will be available with a, a mild hybrid, a plug-in hybrid, or full battery electric option. So, yeah, for us, the future is electric, and this formula is a fantastic way not only to showcase the technology, but also to take away understanding of the technology to make our road cars better. Everybody knows uh, more or less worldwide what is Formula E. They are all uh, interested about the, the technology. The concept of uh, the cities, it's very good because it brings also a new generation of people and very often some young people, which is very positive. To see a series that starts from zero with a concept that people are skeptic about to become a series with uh, so many manufacturers, with so much support, uh, with so much potential still for the future. So, um, I just want to hear what my teammate wants to say. Right. You want some peanuts? All these major manufacturers are bringing out electric cars. They all want somewhere to, to show it off. You know, Mercedes coming in, BMW coming in, Porsche coming in. The speeds will get better. The battery development will continue astronomically. That'll filter down to the road cars. We'll all drive around in electric cars and save the planet. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's the fundamental blueprint of it. It's a fundamental blueprint being adopted around the world. By the end of season four, 20 cities will have attached their name to the Formula E legacy. We are not only racing, we're racing with a very positive message that's fundamental for the, for the success of the series and how the world is, is changing each time more towards this goal and makes me very proud to be part of this. I think Rome is going to be a great race. I think that we don't have huge challenges here. We, we have a great area to race. We have the full support of the authorities, uh, of the local government. We decide to host this race because this is the race. This combines a great past, a great history, classical monuments with the future. Of course it's about politics because we defend certain values, which are to have cleaner cities, want to have cleaner mobility. It's important that the mayors and the authorities and the governments on the, in the places we race share those goals, share those values. What we are finding is that they're becoming almost like universal values. When I became mayor, I have to say honestly, Rome was not green at all. So we have to write our history. I think that this event will will help people's awareness about these issues. At the beginning, uh, people thought it was just like Formula One, and we had to explain that it's completely different. It has the speed, it has the competition, but it is a challenge of sustainability and respect of the environment. So when we show all the benefit that this can bring to Rome, 
they were happy and people and citizens really worked together with us. Four years ago we were really pioneers. Now we are, you know, in the middle of a huge trend. Zurich is a very innovative city, it's a city open to the future. People are very eco-conscious and I think it's a fantastic platform for Formula E to bring back racing. We haven't been having races for over 50 years in Switzerland. They changed the laws in Switzerland to allow a motor race to come and race around the city streets of Zurich. That just tells you what Formula E has done. It's making countries rethink how they should see motorsport and what it stands for. Switzerland itself changing its mentality towards a sport in a progressive way just shows the impact that Formula E has or can have on society. The prospect of staging a race in the streets of a city, the challenges are huge. So when we said we were going to stage 10, people thought we were completely mad. Aside from clearly the logistical issue of having to build a sort of two and a half kilometer racetrack in the middle of a city centre where people are going about their daily business, there's a lot of political pressure for anybody that gets behind an event like this. The first thing that we ask the cities is uh, for a feasibility study. Uh, that is the only way that we found uh, to basically filter the amount of uh, requests that we were receiving from so many cities. The cities are not built in the old days, thinking that in the future there were going to be a, a motorsport event over there. No? So we send our designer over there on place and look where the area of the mayor or, or the city wants to develop that race, if really, if it's feasible or not to do that race. All around the world, we've asked the cities, the mayors, to give us their street for an electric race, for a green race, they do it. Motorsport events I've been involved is very easy. You go from a permanent track to another permanent track. So you know perfectly where the race control is, where the media center room is, where the medical center room, uh, everything is already built. In our case, we have to build all this structure. It doesn't exist. But we're working with teams in far off places from Beijing, Hong Kong, South America, here in North America and around Europe. So you're not on the ground 24 seven. You can't always keep control of it close at hand. So you've got to develop a team and work with a team of people that you can trust, that you know get the picture, that believe in the project as well. What we ask people to do and to deliver has been described as being impossible on a number of occasions. But for time after time after time now for three seasons, we've proven that it is possible with the right people, with the right attitude and, uh, and a bit of nutsness, I think. So, to the task of making it happen. First of all, get the space. Close all the streets. You have to place all these walls and fences for protection. You have to place tech pro barriers. Then you have to install the television. The locations are very dynamic, but they're also city centre, which means that unlike a more standard uh, outside broadcast of a football match or a tennis or athletics, you're working in an area which is not effectively always designated for race coverage. Then you have to build the hospitality areas. You have to build the grandstands around, lay out all the branding for your sponsors. Nice, clean, perfect. And you have to do this, the last part, in 24 hours. The usual day is pretty chaotic. It is a one race day format, so it means we have two practice sessions, qualifying, and then the race all on one day. So we start the crack of dawn on site for 6.30 a.m. Uh, we're on air by quarter to eight, and it just kind of continues from there. I'm so excited to see my first Formula E race. I actually have a Tesla, so I'm a huge advocate. The days are so compact for us with two free practices, all the qualifying groups going on, the lottery, all the media commitments that we have. Plus, each session involves a big briefing and debrief before and after, so it is a super tight, tight day for us. 
it's full on. In F1, for example, you do practice on a Friday, and you go and you think about it, you chat to some people. Qualifying on a Saturday, you think about it, chat to some people. So Sunday, by the time the race comes, you know exactly what's coming, when they're going to pit. Formula E, you get a couple of hours in between qualifying and the race. You go around to speak to teams and they go, yeah, not sure. You know, they, they don't even know because they've had an hour of practice on a brand new track. The broadcast package is a dynamic one hour of action where its unpredictability is part of its success. D'Ambrosio looks up, he's going to hit him, oh my goodness me! The aim of the game is that you put on and throw an amazing event, a spectacular party that everyone is thrilled to be at and really delivers the message of why we're in this, which is to make the transition through to the electric mobility and really change the way people think about things. We see Formula E as the promoter of the circus. We put the circus there, we, put, we create the platform. Particularly the participative way, whether it's the gaming and esports we put in and around the races, or even the fan boost, which is a way for the fans to actually get involved and impact what's going on in the race. It's a way in which sport, media, and entertainment should be traveling. We want to promote electric cars, and we want to do that on a sustainable way. We are part of the whole kind of sustainability movement around the world. Logistics is our main source of CO2 emissions. So you minimize the, the, the carbon footprint of your logistics. You put the races on one continent, then on the next continent. You travel by boat as much as you can. You have electric forklifts to take the things down. You have many different small actions that if you add them all together, really reduce your carbon footprint to a, to a minimum. And then you offset it. The fact that we are helping promote clean mobility in city centers gives all of these partners a very unique story to go back to their board and say, here's what we're doing with Formula E. Companies like DHL now have company mandates from the board to become more sustainable. And we are part of that story for them. We have a, a waiting list of more than 20 cities that would like to be involved in the championship. And nowadays, we do not have a space for them. Really, I think that uh, this is a very nice project. I think it's good for the, for, for the society in general. By season three, one city in particular agreed. A city that had eluded the advances of all other motorsport championships until now. It was time for Formula E to make history again. I think the name New York says it all. Alejandro Agag wanted a race in New York City. He wanted it on season one calendar and Alejandro found his way to my office. To have a race in New York is huge. Uh, to have a race in New York for any championship is huge, and they've all been trying to do it. But I was obsessed with it, so I, I kept going and going for four years, and I wanted to do it in one of the five boroughs of New York. An event of this nature has never been done within the five boroughs before. The fact that Formula E has the advantage of sustainability, has the advantage of minimal sound when their cars are operating, made everything feasible. And at January 2016, Alejandro called me and said, this is the time, I want it on the calendar now. And that's where we really started in earnest. Hammer time for Thor, Hollywood actor Chris Hemsworth. Ah, oh, the New York race was huge, you know, I mean, Hats off to Alejandro and the gang there to get that race. I mean, Formula One's been trying for many years to get there. NASCAR's been trying, IndyCar's been trying, and never been able to crack that nut. You know, seeing, you know, Manhattan there in the background is just incredible. It's like, God, you know how many series wish they were here right now? <laughs> It's wonderful to see, you know, driving for the future. And it's exciting. It's a wonderful party atmosphere. Yeah. And uh, just really happy to be here. Michael, do you fancy a drive in one of these cars? I would. Uh, probably a lot less uh, faster than they're going. It's one of the landmark achievements of our short life. A landmark event? A landmark result. It's 
a completely different pace of life to, to the racetrack. You know, instead of it being fast and furious, this is nice and slow and definitely really slow because the puppy's brand new. He's still a bit unsure on life. Yeah, New York was, was really special. So this is working a lot Sam better for Bird me. Sam Bird very close. Because now Rose is He's done him. He's got him. Oh, he's got him. He's got, got, him. He's got to get it through the corner. Got him for the lead. Fantastic. It was a great week. I was there with Di, Sam's mum, and didn't expect Sam to win. It's victory in New York City for Sam Bird, the first man to win a race in the Big Apple. It's close! Me and Holly looked at each other on the Saturday and we're like, oh my God, we've, we've just won New York. And that night we sort of joked with each other, oh my God, wouldn't it be great if you got in the top five again tomorrow, that would be brilliant for the points and brilliant for the standings. Come on, buddy. Come on, you're just not, you're just not having it today, are you? Excellent, Sam, excellent. Keep that up. And we got back in the hotel room again on Sunday. We were like, oh my God. Did this just happen? Victory on day one and day two for Sam Bird. Yes! It didn't fully sink in for a few days. And then the phone starts ringing and people want to do interviews. And all in all, it was one of the most special race weekends I've ever had. The team aim now to repeat that double on the final weekend of the season. We've had history in uh, motorsport. I was CEO and team principal of uh, the Virgin Racing Formula One team uh, at the outset. And, you know, that was an uncomfortable ride for us. Formula E is very different. We believe that the future of automotive is going to be electric. We think that the electrification of uh, automotive solutions in our cities and urban areas uh, are not only good for people, but good for the planet. And we can do that here in, uh, in Formula E. Looking back, it was a bit crazy. Some teams joining the championship at the beginning were already established race teams in other series, um, where we decided very quickly that we needed to build our own team from scratch. It was a big challenge short term, but the long term benefits would be much greater. When I finished GP2, obviously the, the progression could have potentially been F1. However, to get a Formula One drive these days, you need quite a few million in the bank, and I was lacking all of those millions in the bank. Um, so I had to look at other things, I had to look at other opportunities, and one that I wanted to explore was Formula E. At the time, I didn't have anything. I was living on my own in a one-bed apartment, and I couldn't afford my council tax, and I really needed a job. Otherwise, I was gonna turn my back on racing, and I was that close to having to do that. I then met Alex Ty, uh, and about two weeks later, I got the phone call from Alex saying, look, we'd like you to be our driver. I, of course, said yes. We set up the team at the end of 2013, and six months later, we had a full team, we had four cars, we were testing, we had uh, IT systems, um, and two months after that, we were racing in Beijing. Bird into the right-hander, makes it stick I wanted to be a part of the Virgin Group. What better leader than Sir Richard Branson? Sir Richard is a great businessman, a great environmentalist, really aligned with our goal of, you know, improving the world, fighting climate change and carbon emissions. The whole world should be run on clean energy. You know, this is fast, very, very fast clean energy. Uh, it's, showing, it's showing the car manufacturers what they should be doing. So to have Virgin and to have Sir Richard Branson involved with us, from the beginning was fantastic. I think it's important for the endorsement, uh, especially initially. Obviously, Virgin is a fantastic uh, company. They've always been at the forefront of new ideas and innovations. The major learnings were, you know, involving DS. DS is a luxury brand off of Citroen. Virgin are the engineering team. Uh, the marketing team, so the, they run the car completely and DS supply the, the powertrain that goes into the back of it, which makes it go round and round. Technology that will be on the track tomorrow uh, will hit the street in less than 18 months now. And I think that's the only discipline where you can do that because a lot of the technology 
uh, in Formula E is software related. Software to optimize the efficiency of the car, to optimize the range, the autonomy of the car, and uh, software you can transform very, very quickly from the race uh, to the series production. You shouldn't just wait for the future to come to you. You should try and determine what the future is going to be. You know, the Virgin Group do not make cars. But we are a transportation industry. You know, we've got spaceship companies. You know, if that isn't defining the future, I don't know what is. So what Virgin has been and continues to be is a very trusted brand name in transportation. So if you're going to be ordering a car in the future, maybe you're ordering through a Virgin platform where a Virgin owned and operated autonomous vehicle comes to you and provides that service all over the world. Maybe there's a future in automotive that does have Virgin as part of it. The immediate future was all about the title. For the third year in a row, it was going down to the wire. And once again, it was the defending champion who'd led since the start against his closest rival, who'd been denied the year before. Whoa! Sebastian wow. Buemi, championship leader, out of the second free practice session. The championship can be won today if Sebastian Buemi wins the race, but Degrassi's on pole. And we go green in Montreal. There is Ant holding it on around the outside. Careful and then we contact. Buemi's heading towards the barrier. Just about keeps it out. It's victory wow. for Lucas Degrassi. Brilliant, brilliant maneuvers. Well done. Fourth for Sebastian Buemi. You just dive in like a crazy guy. I have a choice to make. Hit you or dive. The tide had turned. All five lights are on, and we go green in Montreal, and it's a good start from Jean-Éric Verne. Rosenquist has got away well. No problems for Buemi. Buemi's got damage. When things aren't going for you, they're not going for you at all. Here comes Jean-Éric Verne, and he wins in Montreal. But Lucas Degrassi is the Formula E champion. 2070 Formula E. Drivers champion, well done. Thank you, thank you. Beyond the adulation, the reason why the sport exists. I think the first thing that one need to convince uh, him or herself of uh, when embarking in Formula E is do we believe in topics like global warming? Do we believe that the future is autonomous and electric? If there isn't that belief, I think you cannot be credible in embarking on, on the platform. The Ice Drive project is very much an example of Formula E and of Julius Baer. Very strong idea of wanting to communicate a strong message I think Ice Drive was a great statement. I think to take a race car to the ice cap shows exactly what Formula E is. It's technology that doesn't pollute, that you can take to the most pure places in the planet, and you can raise awareness about the problem like uh, the melting of the ice caps. Great idea. Let's put the car on an iceberg. Who will accept the challenge to go to Greenland and drive it? Well, let's ask Lucas. <laughs> I think that the future now of uh, Formula E, nobody can uh, detain it. As a brand, we don't have a limit to how big Formula E can be. It's how fast can cities, how fast can consumers adopt electric mobility. And as fast as that happens, we are the catalyst. If the car manufacturers do not sit up and listen to the fact that this is where they need to be innovating because it's the only type of vehicles they'll be able to sell in the future, which they are, then they will die off. To see it getting faster every year, to see the manufacturers joining, it's just incredibly exciting to see where it's gonna go because electric cars are the immediate future. There's no, there's no getting away from that. 
the show is good, good manufacturer, good drivers. So I think there is no actual limits to what Formula E can become. So the combination of fantastic technology, very fast cars, and also really exciting marketing platform and sporting platform will make Formula E, I think, a fantastic success. It has every potential to be a really big, really prominent, well-known, well-loved sport and brand in the future, and we're excited to be part of it. In my opinion, combustion motorsport will be not accepted anymore in many of the countries. And then everybody will have to be Formula E. This is where the world is going, and this is what we're doing. And so I think just putting these two things together, it makes a lot of sense. I think it offers a huge amount of opportunities for different parties from different horizons to be involved. Financially is getting more and more successful, and I think we will see many more evolutions of what the platform offers. Now things are happening faster and almost exponentially and not linearly anymore. I think if you're investing in Formula E, you're investing in something for the future. We're creating something that is rather unique, where it's pure electric racing, DNA in the cities, sustainability from that. It's an exciting new model. It's a new journey. It's a new path. My dream is that every car in the world is electric one day. If we achieve that, we will have achieved a great thing. I mean, I had to make a huge bet on what I thought was the next big thing. Everybody said, this is gonna fail. I took a leap of faith. The leap of faith worked.